Welcome to Design Talk 13. This design talk is about a vintage die-cast drive-in speaker. Pictured here is a set I modeled in SolidWorks and rendered in KeyShot. It's based on reference material, but I did make a few changes to make it mine, so to speak. Since I turned 60 a couple of years ago, I've found myself reminiscing about the past and vintage products in particular. I'm not sure if this is just a sign of old age or if it's an interest that's been rekindled since my retirement. It's not that I'm longing for the past, but it's more of a reflection on it. Looking back allows me to appreciate the styles that I took for granted when those items were in daily use throughout the world. Are you familiar with the items pictured here? Just for the sake of the story, take note of the commercial coffee grinder at the top right. I first encountered one of these when I started working at Safeway when I was 15 years old. I can still picture it at the end of the coffee aisle directly across from the meat counter. Every Safeway store had one and customers could choose and grind their own beans. As you can imagine, they left a heck of a mess and one of my jobs was to clean up after them. And let me tell you, that was a regular job. At any rate, I still get a kick out of looking at this render. It was so much fun to model and to reminisce. Many products in the world today are made from the die casting process, and this has been true since about 1838 when one of the first patents for it appeared. When I stumbled across a picture of a drive-in speaker, I decided that it'd be a great example of a product produced by this process. As always, I did a YouTube search for restoration videos and a Google search for additional reference material. As I reviewed the video and additional materials, I made notes to help me gain a better understanding of the speaker and to help me create the 3D model and detail the drawings. I must say that it is always surprising just how much info is available out there in cyberspace if one takes the time to look. It's not my intention to go into the actual process of die casting as it's a very in-depth topic that I know very little about. But I would like to mention that there's a lot of good information out there about it. Pictured here is a web page that I found ideal for a brief overview. Check it out if you're interested. When I first thought about using the drive-in speaker for the subject matter of this design talk, I assumed that it would be zinc die-cast, but both restoration videos said that what they found was aluminum. I don't know if that's accurate or not, but I just took them at their word. When I was active in the manufacturing world, our main focus was on plastic and aluminum extrusions, but we occasionally had a need to have smaller parts die-cast for us. In this case, we almost always spec'd zinc for tool and part longevity. As with most of my design talks, I decided to use SolidWorks to model the drive-in speaker. So let's move into SolidWorks now and look at the drive-in speaker in all of its glory. So here we are in SolidWorks. Here you can see on screen that I've modeled a speaker tower with two speakers. I did that so as I modeled, I could go ahead and determine the angle and whatnot I needed to make this hang properly. Now, I didn't model the guts of the tower, but I certainly did the guts of the speaker, which we're going to look at fairly shortly. So let's go back to ISO view, and then let's go ahead and open up a speaker to have a look at it. So here we have the speaker opened, and we're going to have a peek at this pretty quick. So we'll just do a little bit of an orbit to have a look at it so far as it is. You can see that I have the wires fairly short here, and we'll see how I dealt with lengthening them for the drawings and whatnot. All right, so let's go ahead and do an exploded view. So I've already set up an exploded view here so that the, when I explode this, it'll fill up the screen. So I'm going to go to configurations and I'm going to right mouse click over exploded and select animate explode. So that's going to explode for us, just like so, and show us our various parts. So if we have a little bit of a closer look, we can see that we have a knob here, the front of the main body, there's the inside of it. Here we have a screen, our speaker, screws for the speaker, a pop meter, our wiring, the back of the main body, that's the inside of it. And then we have our hang plate and some more screws. 
So I will go ahead and collapse this. And we'll switch back to isometric view. So I want to do a review of two or three of these parts so that you can get a really good look at how I went about producing them. Maybe I'll pick up some pointers from them. And then we're going to go ahead and look at the drawings that I made. So I'm going to select this. And then I'm going to select to open that part. So here's that part opened up on its own. Body front, I'm calling it. And here, if we look at the design tree, we can see all the steps that it took to create that. So what I'm going to do is roll this all the way back to the top, and then we'll work through this and look at the build process. Good. So I actually started by inserting an image, one of my reference things. And because it had a ruler in there and it had a pretty decent front view, I used that to help me determine its shape, basically. You can see that there's an arch up here, and there's one on the bottom, and there's an arch towards the sides. And so I kind of needed something to help me determine what that was. So this came in quite handy. So I started by tracing a profile around here and adding my own dimensions as I saw fit. And then I went ahead and extruded this out with draft angle. The thing about working with die casting or any kind of molding process is if you use taper or draft angle, it helps to be able to remove it from the molds easier. I mean, you can build without draft angle, but then you need to look at creating more complex molds that are more than one part or multi-part, as they call it, that have ejectors and all kinds of stuff. So if you can include draft angle in your design, then you might end up with cheaper tooling in the long run. So I'm going to go ahead and hide that image. And we'll continue on. So here I started, like I said, extrusion with draft. I filleted these. And then I went on and filleted these corners here. All right, so next I went and created a cut loft in here. So you can see a couple of planes that I bypassed up here. But you can place planes wherever you need to in order to help you lay out your sketches where you need them to be. So I'll explain them if I need to, but just know that that's how I use them. All right, next I went and placed a fillet in here. And then I wanted to shell this unit. So I did a shell. That's how it looks. So sometimes it's best to add a lot of these features in here before you shell so that it incorporates them in part of the process. So next I needed to do some work on the front here. So I created some split lines. Does that look like that? And then I knit some surfaces together. Be this, these three here. And then I offset them a little bit. So the offset pushes that forward as desired. But you can see that it's an offset surface. It's not full here. So I did a thicken on that to bring them together, just like so. Next, I did a loft. And what that is, is just two different sketches. This one here coming off the bottom. And then I projected it down to the bottom level here. And then I lofted between the two. And because this has a draft angle, this starts to get buried in here, which was the desired effect. So I mirrored that to the opposite side. And then I did a fillet of these two edges here, or corners, or rounds, to make them smooth transition all the way around. So that's what that was for. Next I did a cut extrusion. So here you can see a plane. I just made one up above there. And I drew my sketches on there. And then I cut through this portion only, not this main body part. Then I did some filleting. Where is that? Just in here. And then I combined this unit with this unit. So that's like a 3D addition. 
So now they're one part or one component. And this is where they transitioned to be buried. And so that makes a nice transition line in that area. Another cut extrude. So in that one I did use this plane up top again and then I cut through all of these except I don't think I used the end ones here. Yeah, I didn't. So I used just inside here those selected ones. And then the next cut extrude was doing these top two. Now if you look at this area down here, this is where we're starting to get a curve. And so you have to take a lot of care in how you do that. You can't just extrude cut down through both of these because you'll have a weird look down in this area. So what you end up having to do is create a split line. In this case it's these two. I've split off this face and this face here. And then I've knit those together. And then I did a subtraction cut or a cut a cut thicken to cut downward. So this would still follow this curve even down in this area. So I did this one over here and I did a cut thicken there as well. Just like so. Next was a boss extrusion. I'm not sure where that is just yet but it looks like it was back here to create this portion. Then another boss extrusion to create these bosses here. And the plane above that was defining where they would stop up in the opened here. And then when these are extruded with draft, I use the extrude to surface so that they go down to that location. And then I added some tapped holes. And it looks like I have a mistake down here because this should be uh, number 832. So I must have been able to select that in there, and I just chose it by accident. Then I added some threads in all of those units. And I'm pretty sure I used 832 in there. Anyway, it's good to check your work out because you might find mistakes like I often do. And it's good to catch them before production, of course. Okay, next I did another boss extrusion here. So here I'm working on these units here. And again, I had set the plane at a specific height to stop those, or to start those at this location. And then I could extrude down to this surface. And then I did the opposite side. And then some holes. Where are those? Oh, well, that's down here. That's for the pot meter. And then another boss extrude. Okay, that's up here. I'm starting to work on this area up here. And then some split line up here, knitting that surface, and then thickening. Where is that? Not sure where that is. That might be down here, I guess. Yep. And then a more split line. That's splitting this area off in here. Knitting that surface. And I'm doing that again because this is including coming all the way down this curve again. So it's not just a matter of extrude cutting because it would look different down here than you'd want. So I did a cut thicken to cut this area in here to include this little bit of the curve, just like so. Some more filleting. That's just on the inside here. And then more filleting. That's on the outside of these. Now here you can see a different color. And I did that by changing the appearance of this face. And I did that so when I bring this into Keyshot, I can select this as a different material really, really easily. Another boss extrude. That was creating the brand name on here. And of course, I used my own name for fun. And then some filleting. 
So that's back here. Some more filleting. That's back here as well. And then some more filleting around these various items here. Next was a cut sweep. And here is I created a little um, recess here. I narrowed it down this lip here so that the back, when it comes in, it has a piece that comes down on this side. So it was just doing a sweep of this profile to subtract it. Then I did 832 tapped holes, and then I threaded those four units as well. Another fillet. That's just a small fillet around this edge here. And now cut extrude. Where is that? It's over here. It's starting to make the hole for the, the cord bushing or cord restraint. And then I created a plane just to the side of this. It's tangent to this edge or this face. And then I did a cut extrude to make a little bit of a seat in here. And then one more cut extrude. Where is that? Oh yeah, that's down here. That's just a little bit of a drain hole. Good. So I'm going to switch back to isometric view. And then I'm going to go back to the speaker assembly. And let's go ahead and open up this part and have a look at it. So the rear body started out as a copy of the front body after I'd finished it. So it helped to preserve a lot of the features that I needed, but it also needed a lot of tweaking here and there. So when you're in SolidWorks, you're able to move this to wherever you need it to go, and then you can add procedures if you need at that location, or you can edit any of these various things if you need to do that. So we'll just go through the build of this really quickly. So it's, some of it's going to look the same, so we'll just go through it fairly quickly. So here's that initial extrusion, but I went in the opposite direction, I think. Pretty sure I changed which way it was going out. Maybe not, I don't know. Next, uh, fillets, as you saw before. I left some of these planes in here, even though I didn't need them and down to this extrusion. So here you can see I had rolled this up from bottom to this location and added this in at this location so that I could include it as part of the shelling. So before I did the shelling, I went and filleted it in here and then I shelled. So now we can see that's included that in there. So next is the split line and I think that's back up front again that we did that before and it is. So knitting of those surfaces, offsetting and thickening. Again we've kept the loft and the mirror. We've kept the filleting and then we went ahead and kept all of that as it was and combined it as it was. And then we did a different cut here that to remove the back portions because on this unit it only has a little bit on the sides comes around a little bit like that so then i filleted that side and then i filleted this side to round them all off like that next i created another boss or i didn't recreate it because that's from before that's fine Again there. This time I added a little bit. So this is the male portion or the other portion of this unit where they join together. So in this case I um, put the profile on the top here and then I did a sweep extrude around the whole unit like so. Number eight, clearance holes. Now those go through here. And then I went and filleted 
in these locations. Where is that? So that was from before as well. Cut extrude. Pretty sure that's in here to create a countersink. So I had changed the plane to the location I wanted it here and then extrude cut outward. Some more filleting. Again, some more filleting. That was from before. That's this edge here. And again, some more filleting. And that's on the inside of this. So next I created a boss extrusion across this location. And then I cut that down like that, just to be more like ribs, I guess. And then I filleted those. Another cut extrusion. And that's just trimming this out a little bit to make room for the hang plate. And another boss extrusion. So I decided that if we're putting screws into here, and this was, I think, what is it, only an eighth of an inch thick? Actually a sixteenth, because I cut a chunk out of here yet. I thought we better put some bosses in here to make room for some threads. So I did that. And then I filleted it in there. Hopefully this would work in the process. But whoever I got to do this, bender-wise, they would tell me if that wasn't acceptable. So next was some tapped holes over on this side. And then I added threads to those as well. Another boss extrusion, that's just down here for a label. Just gives it a little bit of a highlighted area. And then I did some filleting on that. Next was cut extrusion. Again, that was from before. Or I might have had to make the extrusion go in the opposite direction. I think that's exactly what it was. And then I made a seat for there as well. And one last cut extrusion, which was down here. Now I just created a hole, but in my drawings, I'm going to say that it's OK to cut this square out if need be, which it probably will be. Anyway, going back to isometric southeast view. And I'm going to go back to the speaker assembly. And then I think we'll look at one more component. And that's going to be the speaker inside. So I did create that from scratch. And we'll just have a quick look through that one. So I'm going to open that up. And now we'll have a quick review. So we'll just orbit a little bit. Have a look at it for now, like so. And then we'll go back to isometric view. So as before, we'll go ahead and roll this up to the top. And here I went ahead and started by inserting an image. So we'll have a look at that. So I just found this on the internet. Looked about like what I wanted. So the first thing I did was create a boss extrude of, of this front plate. So I'll just hide this image again. And the sketch just looked like that. And it was a simple extrusion. Then I did a cut extrude to create this opening in here and another cut extrude to create a bit of a lip in there. Next I filleted the outside corners and now I wanted to work on the back portions and I wanted to use a revolve to get started so I went ahead and inserted another image or the same image in a different orientation on a different plane to help me as a trace aid. So the first thing I did was lay out a sketch that looked like this. And then I revolved it. So I'm just going to hide that image. And then that's what that looked like. Next I did a cut extrude to create a hole in here, or this unit like that. And then I did a circular pattern of that. And I fill it at all the corners of those units, just like so. Next, I did another revolve just to create this unit in here. It's a pretty straightforward 
profile, and then another revolve to create this little bound around here. And again, in a cut extrude, just to create a little bit of a circular slot in here. It's kind of where that thing moves in and out with the magnet. I don't know exactly how it works, but I've taken apart a few in my day just to see how they work. Next is a, another revolve. That's to create the component that goes in and out and attaches to the diaphragm, if that's what it's called. So I created the diaphragm. It's probably not very accurate, but this is what the sketch looks like. Then I revolved that, as I said. Then I did another revolve to create this portion. And then another revolve to put a little dome over top of that. Just like so. Next I added a sketch to help me set up a work plane tangent to this area down here. Like so. Then I created a boss extrusion of this unit here. Now I could have moved this down, but that's where it is. And I was happy enough, I guess, with that. Next I created a, a revolve to make a rivet there, just like so. And then I did a new plane over in this location, so I could do a mid-plane extrusion of a profile that I created for this unit. It's very straightforward, just looked like that. Then I filleted the 3D unit of it, and then I chamfered that, and a cut extrude like that. Another cut extrude like so. And then a boss extrude to create this particular wing. There's the sketch for that one. Filleting, chamfering, and cut extrude to make it look like the other one. Then I mirrored that over to the opposite side. Did a cut extrude for that hole. Did another revolve for here. That's another type of rivet, I guess. And mirrored that over there. And then I filleted. Looks like just around here. And then one last fillet just around there. So that's pretty straightforward. It was kind of fun to make. And it kind of showed the use of the different planes, you know, making them tangent so you can work off the areas where you want to work. So I'm going to switch back to isometric view. So now we'll go ahead and have a look at the drawings. They should go pretty quickly, but I think you'll find it interesting to look at. So here we're looking at sheet one. It's a multi-sheet drawing series. And I typically make the first sheet the assembly drawing. So here I typically show isometric view, an exploded view, and I add a bill of materials. Of course, if we look down here, we have a typical title block, including drawn by, designed by. Here we have a note about what the dimensions are in. In this case, it's going to be inches. Here's a note about copyright, sheet size, scale, and whatnot. So my second sheet, I typically use a layout sheet that shows a number of the different views and then just shows some envelope sizes. So sheet three, we're starting to look at the individual parts. In this case, it's the body front. So this is a pretty complex part with lots of draft angles and such. And so it's quite a challenge to lay it all out and dimension everything and not forget something. So if you're looking at this and you see missing dimensions, well, that's just par for the course, especially in a presentation like this where I'm not really focusing on making it 100% complete. So not in this case, but in some cases where I worked, we'd occasionally send 3D models without, uh, without draft angle, and the vendors would remake them with the proper draft requirements because we didn't really know what we were doing sometimes. 
but they always kept us in the loop and would always get approval on everything. So we ended up with getting a part that would be easily manufactured according to industry specifications. So if we look down here, we're starting to see we're adding materials and finishes, and we're adding some specific notes. So here we're going to ask for zinc, and we're asking for polished exterior, but we also repeat that in our notes over here. We also ask for breaking all sharp edges, the high gloss exterior, interior can remain natural. Then we're looking at this face in here. We want to have a different face finish on it, different micro finish. So we're specifying what we want there. And then we're asking for the letters to be painted according to our paint spec sheet. Now I didn't make a spec sheet like that for these drawings, but I certainly would if required. So if we look closer here, we can start to see that we have all kinds of views that you'd see in, in any kind of typical drawing. Front view, side view, top view, section views, detail views, things like that. All our dimensions. Here we've got whole callouts and things like that specifically pointing out certain notes, stuff like that. So pretty complex, and I'm sure I didn't do a very comprehensive job on this, but it's good enough to get started. So the next sheet is the back. So whenever I make the next sheet for a series, I don't want to have to retype all of this stuff. So on this one, I would have right mouse clicked on the body front sheet, selected copy, and then I would have right mouse clicked and select paste. You're not seeing it here because I haven't copied anything. And then it would say, where do you want it pasted? And then I'd select after the next sheet or after the last sheet. And so what comes over is what was on that sheet. So quite often on these kind of things, I'll take what was there and I'll slide it over to the side. So we can see how these parts look similar, and I kind of wanted to lay them out in the same way to kind of keep a nice flow in the drawings. So I put them over here, I bring in the new part, and then I lay it out and I try to mimic what I did in this area, or for this part. So again, we have the different views, cross sections again, things like that whole callouts, all of the same stuff. Same finish in that, so if you get a, your next sheet and you have a different type of part that's different material, you'll have to remember to change these. Of course, change your title a bit if need be, and change the notes if need be. Here's a note about the label, and I don't even think I put a label in the drawing, which is something I'd certainly, certainly add. Next sheet is the screen. So as I was working on this one and thinking about it later on and putting in the drawing, I thought these holes are really, really tiny. And so I thought it might be a good idea to get a hold of some perforated steel and see what the holes look like. I made these 1 16th of an inch and that's pretty small. They might end up need needing to be 1 8th. I think that's more common size that you might be able to find. So here I'm saying I want this type of aluminum, and for finish, I put C notes. So perforations may travel across all the outer edges. I'm pointing that out here, just like it does over here. So if you were getting a sheet that's completely filled with holes but larger, you could cut it out there, and I don't care about that in that sense. So we want to polish one of the larger faces, the one that sticks outward. And then I also put a note here about the possibility of using alternate hole pattern size, but that has to come with approval. Next is a simple hang plate. It's again just aluminum. Cut to size, couple of holes, some rounded edges. Break all sharp edges and polish all faces and edges on this one because it's exposed everywhere. Next is the speaker. So this would typically be a stock part that you'd buy, 
but you'd certainly want to get a hold of a sample to ensure that it's going to give you exactly what you want specification wise and you'd want to have it probably before you finalize the design of this just in case you needed to change change some of the boss locations or even the size of this hole in front so i just made a note here but we did mention that that's just for me. Now you notice that I have leaving stuff out on the outside of these sheets. I do that quite often just for notes for myself or if I want to copy and paste from sheet to sheet different things then I have them available because when you print this sheet to PDF or to paper it's only going to print what's on here. So having things out in the open can be kind of handy thing to have. So if we look at the speaker we're just looking at the notes so it's off the shelf four inch speaker check fit before supplying and I know absolutely nothing about this type of thing so you'd want to make sure you had your wattage and your ohms and all of that jazz specified out in this case this has a that unique two tab connectors so you'd want to ensure that you'll be able to get that and here we've looked at the sizing and I did that by checking out this section here and seeing what it looks like for how much space we have so you got a pretty good spread in here so your speaker could could look a lot different than this one as long as it fit of course so sheet 8 is the pot meter again I don't know anything about this and you'd want to confirm that it fit this hole and it fit with your knob and all of those various things and then of course you'd have to define all your specifications. I just put question marks because I wouldn't have a clue at this point what I would need. Next sheet is the wiring. It's kind of fun to do the wiring when you're working on a 3D model. So I would definitely purchase this as a harness. In this case it would have to be a three-piece harness. There's the main cord with two leads and then there's these two separate leads here. So in my working world, I used to do the electrical in two or three different ways. Here you can see the first, which we're showing it as it is in that model. And this is small enough and simple enough that it actually could work just like this. So I've placed the view and then I've defined each of these various things as needed. Here's some notes about what type of wiring, the current voltage, all of that stuff that's typically noted with that type of thing. So another way that I would often do it or in combination with is like this. I'd make a, a new assembly or parts as needed and I'd lay them out like this. And these aren't completed because I didn't add the notes as needed which is certainly something I would do on that as opposed to this. This I might just show up in the corner without any detail but then show this using all of this data. And the other way I might do it is more of a schematic way. Now this doesn't have any labeling either, but I would lay this out just like that. That kind of looks similar to that. And then I'd take all those labels and put them in. So in this case, I would have this small again up in this area and I'd add this with all the detail. I'd label these as to what they are. Same with this. Now this looks pretty light down in here and I typically use that gray because if you move that over here it shows up pretty good on the paper anyway. Just keep that in mind as options as you work through this type of thing. So one thing I didn't mention when I was talking about ordering this as a harness was that I would probably have this shipped as a harness in a bag so the, the longer bits could be coiled up and tucked into the bag along with the two separate pieces. That way when you're pulling out on the manufacturing floor in your assembly line you just have to grab the one thing. And here I've got my length specified and before I would do that I would experiment to finalize my various lengths doing an actual prototype harness and seeing how it all fit and work, that type of thing. So next sheet is the knob. It's quite possible this, this part could be found as an off-the-shelf stock part somewhere. 
but you'd have to make sure that it fit with your pot meter, all of that jazz. This is another crazy one to try to dimension because it's taper or draft angle on everything. So I'm not sure I did a very good job defining it. And thank goodness for a modern era where you're actually making 3D models because you can send the 3D model along with your drawings to your vendor and they can utilize both as they need. Maybe that's not industry standard, but whatever works is what works. So our next sheet is the cord bushing. This is just a standardized part that I downloaded from McMaster Car. Now just because I used a part from McMaster Car doesn't mean I need to specify it, but they do supply 3D models for users with that hope, I guess. But they sure make it nice for modeling, being able to grab those without having to recreate them oneself. So that's our cord restraint, or cord bushing, as they call it. And then the next two sheets are just some simple screws, also downloaded from McMaster Car. So that's the drive-in speaker in a nutshell and the thoughts and the motivation behind it. I hope that you enjoyed the presentation and that it'll give you some things to think about while designing your own products. If you'd like to see some TurboCAD tips for free, visit Don Check's TurboCAD tips page. And if you're interested in delving deeper into TurboCAD learning, be sure to check out the full project tutorials on my textual creation shopping page. See you next time.